All right, so it's really simple, three phases. How we produce energy is obviously the first, the first major factor. How you create force, second major factor. And how we transmit force is the third major factor. And then as an add-on to that is the, the technical components as well. So if you can do all those three, three things well, and you're a very good technically gifted athlete, then you're in a pretty good position. So how does this relate to, to what we're interested in? What we've got in, in boxing is we've got fast muscle actions, okay, for those high force punches, fast muscle actions occurring. We've got something called momentum. I'm not going to dig too much into the, the physics, but the momentum is, is something that's really important in boxing. It explains a lot about punching performance. And then we have the second pulse or an effective mass. So Dan touched on that, that earlier. Um, and is a, actually quite an important part of, of making contact and punching and how effective a punch is. So slide, another, another bit of a, a graph here. So what we've got here is down here we've got time. Okay, so this is the time from, from the onset of muscle action. So what the researchers done here, Scandinavian researchers, they've got, they've got um, participants in a dynamometer which measures strength and they've got them to, to kick out okay and what they've done is they've looked at how quickly they develop force and over what time period so this is time here then what they've done is they've looked at how strong they are okay so they've done a maximum test so they've gone boom and, and tried to work out what the maximum force is that the quadriceps can produce and then they've looked at how that maximum strength relates to how quickly you can produce force. So this axis here is, is something called a correlation coefficient that then we can look at how closely something is explained by another thing. And the, the higher this figure, the more we can become confident that one thing explains another. So in this respect, it, it relates to how well does strength, maximum strength, relate to how quickly you can develop force, okay? So whilst I'm gonna explain this, just have in your mind the fact that, you know, some people still think being strong, lifting weights makes you slow, okay? Just have that, that, uh, that in mind, okay? So, here we go. So a punch is delivered in 200 milliseconds or less, rapid. Danny's got a smirk on his face because hopefully what we've got coming up is an absolute beauty of a slide. So here's our, here's our um, punch speed. So it's around 200 milliseconds here. And what we've got here is the relationship between strength and the rate of force development. So as time increases, what we've got here is an increase in this relationship so that when a punch is delivered over this time frame, strength explains 90% of how much force you can produce. So the stronger you are, the faster you can produce force over that time period. It's as simple as that. Okay. Ah, oh, there you go. I forgot I'd done that. The stronger you are, the more, likely, uh, the more likely you can produce force quickly. So if you're strong and you've got strong to, through weight training, it's not gonna make you slow gonna make you fast, it's gonna, it's gonna help you produce force in a very short amount of time and a lot of force. If you add in a second pulse to that as well, which is what I'll, I'll come on to in a second, then you've also also got a very large explanation here too. So more strength, quicker force, force generation. Does it matter the time under tension when you are doing reps and stuff? Because obviously, going heavy, mm. you want it's going to you want it to be as controlled as yeah. possible, and yeah. the eccentric part you don't want to rush it either. Yeah. Do you want to get it up as quick as possible when you're doing reps? Yeah, it, de it depends on yeah, it depends on what the what the training focus is. Most types of training have have a role, you know, and, and it just depends on where and when you need to put that type have of training. Slow. 
controlled reps as well as having some quicker yeah i mean yeah it just, it, yeah i mean it depends on the athlete depends on on the on the training phase that that they're in as well and what type of training history that they've got yeah. um but if you are if you are doing slower reps then generally you're not training the amount of force that you can produce quickly Okay. So it would be better to, to move that with, or have the intention to move that, that quickly because that will, that will change the way your neuromuscular system yeah. activates the muscles. Okay. Go on then, mate. You can see there how you know how it's really important that you develop force in you know a really short space of time. You know, it, it can be highly effective. You know, and, and Jordan's you know one of the one of the strongest relatively on the program as well. So hence why force force generation, the ability to produce a lot of force and strength, is really important in boxing. Another thing that contributes is something called the impulse momentum relationship. Now this is, this is the relationship that NASA use to send space rockets to Mars or wherever into space. And we use it as well to, to help Jordan knock people out. <laughs> um, so if you can increase momentum, uh, then you can deliver a harder punch. Problem is, if you're not a heavyweight, and to an extent you've also got that problem, um, it's very difficult to, to influence momentum through one factor that is an important contributor to it, and I'll go on that in a second. So if we break it down, we have impulse, which is simply the relationship or the amount of force you can produce over a certain period of time. That's it. Okay. Momentum is mass times velocity. So what it means is we've got force over time and we saw in the previous slide how producing force very quickly is important. So if you can produce a lot of force quickly, then you're very impulsive. If you can move your mass very quickly, then you have a lot of momentum. Simple, NASA, NASA says so. Yeah, there we go. So you can either be a rocket, and we all know the boxes that look like rockets, but aren't that effective. Or you can be an elephant, and we all know the elephants that are slow as well, don't we? So a rocket produces a lot of force, very quickly, very impulsive, whereas an elephant has a lot of momentum, because they've got a, primarily got a large mass. Or you can be like this guy. So we can strap this rocket, this force, to the elephant, okay? And we can move this. Imagine if this were, this were coming at you. This is gonna <laughs> knock you out. <laughs> that was, yeah, that's from an EE advert. I was like, I'm having that. This is what we need. It's from a few years ago, but this, this explains it completely. You know, if you can, if, you, if you've got a lot of mass, you know, and you, you're a, uh, let's say you're a heavyweight boxer uh, and you've got a big rocket, you can produce a lot of force, then you can produce a lot of speed too. And that's gonna hurt some people. I go the wrong way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, obviously we've got AJ down here and then who's that Pacquiao? Oh, there's a canvas in my gym. <laughs> So that's, that's the reason why AJ can, can hit so hard, is because he's, he's so fast. He's a, he's a heavy weight. He's awesome. Well, so Daniel, Frank Bruno was built the same way as um, Josh. Josh. Yeah. And, um, but he didn't move as fast as Josh, so 
what's went on there? Science. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the, the type of, of training that, that AJ does, a lot of it is around speed, but he's putting on mass as well. He's getting bigger, isn't he? And he's, he's carrying that speed through. Um, so, yeah. In terms of that velocity fitness, isn't it? Over in Birmingham, I think he does a lot of his training in that. Yeah. So, so, yeah, he's working on the velocity part of that yeah. <laughs> impulse momentum relationship. Okay. So the big problem for, for, for us is, is improving momentum. <clears throat> and the easiest way to do that is to put on mass. But when you, you, you're weight restricted, it's pretty difficult, unless you're transferring mass to different areas of the body, which is also pretty difficult. OK, so this is, we're just uh, going over the slide that we've just done here. So if you're AJ or you're a light, lightweight but we can change momentum not by changing mass but getting more impulsive so creating and, and producing more force so this is where we come in helping our guys produce more force and producing quickly that's going to change let's go back it's going to change velocity so if this stays the same and we change this, velocity will increase, speed will increase. And we know how devastating speed is when you've got the force. NASA says so. Okay. The third component of producing force is having this, this effective mass up. <clears throat> what, you, what we've got here, <laughs> what we've got here is an illustration of how force is delivered on impact. Okay, so as well as being as an impulsive boxer when you're generating force, you can also be an Im impulsive boxer when you're delivering the punch as well. And that occurs through creating effective mass and something called the, the second pulse. So some researchers in America uh, have looked at when there are peaks in, in muscle activity during different striking actions and, and punches and kicks. And what they found is that there's an increase in force, uh, an increase in muscle activity on the initiation of a punch, but then there's a, as Dan said, there's a, a relaxation before you then stiffen up on impact. So this first part of the curve here is that initial muscle activity, but then there's another peak here as well. Don't think you can see it up there, but yeah, so this is the, on the impact, there is another peak in muscle activity. Now you might just think that, oh, you, you know, you throw a punch in and that's it. But actually, you know, combat athletes, they, they have a second pulse in activity as well, which often people don't, either they don't know about or they don't train, neither. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and so what you've got is you've got, uh, what they found is that you've got these on off pulses of different muscles. So this is, the first pulse is the initiation of movement, and then as speed increases, the muscles relax, and then they undergo this second pulse, and that creates a, a stiffness as well. So that's another way in which you can create force, which is not generally well appreciated. And then Dan went through a lot of this in, in, in the mobility section, but you can produce energy and produce a lot of it, or you can produce force and produce a lot of it, but if you're limited in the way that you can transmit that force, it's not going to get from the foot all the way to the fist. And so the way that we describe this is through this, this thing called a kinetic chain. So what we want is this nice, clean force transmission that's not limited throughout the range. And that's really dependent upon a few, a few uh, mechanisms that, that determine how much tension you can produce at different muscle lengths uh, and how quickly you can produce, you produce force at different muscle lengths as well. Um, so the first one is this length force, re force relationship. So something that we did for the science behind Golovkin was trying to explain why he's so devastating in his punches. And he generally is most effective in that mid range where his muscles are actually in the optimal position for producing tension. So, so he's very effective at producing forces, but that second pulse, if we were to stick EMG sensors on him, it would be huge 
because he's able to stiffen up and produce isometric force and tension on that impact. So he can produce a lot of force at this top, top end of the curve because of this muscle length. So he mainly throws mid-range punches, meaning that he's going to have that, that larger impulse on his target. So he can produce a lot of force, but also he's delivering a lot of force on, on the target as well. I just uh, step, step in, um, like what we were doing with Jordan earlier, that kind of, that kind of rotation. If we improve that rotation so he can punch the bear, if he's still landing here, it's like then the relationship is going to be much better. If he's at end, if it's like rotational capacity there, it's not going to produce as much force. It's like kind of punching that end, end range. Flicking the, flicking the nerves, right? and, and it's hard to produce force all the way up there. But if you if you are capable of moving all the way to there, when you actually land in there, or land in Marquez against Pacquiao when you're there, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to be able to produce a little bit more force. Mm. Just put it in context of what I talked about earlier, the movement training. Yeah, so you can see the relationship between muscle length and force. So as this range increases, you get, you get an optimum amount of force, but then the amount of force you can produce as the muscle either, either lengthens or shortens also gets less as well, also yeah, gets less. So you produce less force, but you can actually train that as well. So you can, you can train to produce more force at either greater or shorter muscle lengths. Another very important relationship is the amount of force that you can produce dependent to the, the amount of speed that you can produce as well. And so this part of the, the curve represents eccentric muscle actions, which, which we probably won't focus on now. But in a concentric action, what you have is, is the, the quicker you can produce, is the faster you are, the less force you can produce which is counterintuitive to what I've, I've just said. But, but it explains why you see guys that are really, really quick, but very ineffective. You know, so, you, so you need that balance between how much force you can produce um, and how, how effective that, that force is at the speed that you're producing it. 